Izumi Uchiha's story is one we're following closely, the secret love Itachi had from his youth. As all things are taken away from him, one mercy is granted. There is, of course, a part one to this story, and if you have yet to see it, I highly recommend checking it out before we continue. We'll leave a link in the description. Now, let's get into it. Welcome to the Amagi! Before we begin, we publish a new video every day, so be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. Also, we just released some brand new merch. If you'd like to show your support for the channel even further while at the same time repping stylish clothing, be sure to check that out as well. The store is linked below. YouTube's been unsubscribing users from channels lately, so if you're a fan of us, please do us a favor and double check to see if you're still subscribed. It only takes a second and it helps us a ton here at Amagi. And with that out of the way, Let's get into the video. When we last saw Izumi, she had been spared by Itachi as the rest of her clan fell. Waking up alone in a hospital, she was visited by Itachi, who would commission her to protect Sasuke, all while vowing to watch over her with Wotan, the crow he had implanted Shisui's Sharingan into. So from that point on, she did just that, and watched over Itachi's little brother like an older sister. But Sasuke is distant, being focused only on his revenge. This has led to him becoming quite isolated, with the only person capable of breaking into his life and having any lasting impact being Naruto. But this was threatened when it was revealed that Naruto had committed a renegade act by stealing the Scroll of Seals. Izumi must track down and face him, all while confronting the darkness in her heart that exists due to Naruto's status as host of the Nine Tails, the beast that killed her father. Upon finding him, they return with him to the village where he's reprimanded and she's allowed to go home. The next day, she's laying in bed. The sun was up, the sky was blue, the birds were chirping. Today was a wonderful day, and Izumi had decided to spend it inside sleeping. Outside of her room, Sasuke was cooking something to eat, something only for himself as it seemed she wasn't planning on adulting today. Lazy, he mumbled under his breath as he flipped the egg over, forming a perfectly cooked omelet. Pouring some orange juice into a cup, he sat down for breakfast and began to eat. Eat. Today was a big day. He would finally be placed on a shinobi team. Was he excited about this? Well, about as excited as Sasuke can be. Today was the first step a milestone in his journey to murdering Itachi. All he had to do was join his team, gain experience, and allow his abilities and powers to develop under the watchful eye of a master, whose job it was to ensure he properly grew as a shinobi. As he finished the omelette and downed the last portion of juice, he stood and made his way out of the house. Izumi would eventually get out of the bed at about 30 minutes to noon. She would get something light, a piece of toast, and head out. She had no duties today, but she also had nothing to do, so she would wander the village listening to people talk. Meeting with her peers, she heard them mention that he had been allowed to become a genin. The shinobi spoke with contempt, as if letting him do so was a disservice to the village. And he did it using one of the forbidden jutsu he learned after stealing the scroll of seals, the shinobi said. The peer with which he was talking would reply, I don't see why Lord Third didn't just execute him on the spot. If it were me, I would have just thrown the little demon up and under the prison. He wasn't too soft. Izumi listened to their speech. There was a time when she had thought the same, but realizing the truth about it, she couldn't bring herself to hate Naruto. He was merely doing his duty a duty that was forced on him from the village itself. To a point, she was even glad that he passed. She hoped that he might be placed on Sasuke's team. Maybe that would force Sasuke to open up and accept him as a friend. Maybe then Sasuke would give up this toxic dream of fratricide. She would walk about the village, enjoying her day off before returning home. She would prepare something else to eat. It was nearly dusk and Sasuke hadn't come home yet. It was a busy day for him apparently. Normally, teachers didn't take their students on a mission their first day, but she assumed that perhaps his teacher wanted to help break Sasuke into that life. Eventually though, Sasuke did return home, and upon coming home, she would greet him and go through the same tired rigmarole of asking him how his day was, and his response was the same as usual, fine. But this time, it didn't pack a punch to it. It seemed like a genuine response. Maybe he was in a good mood today, or perhaps he was just too tired to have an attitude. The look of his clothes and the pungent smell of sweat, grass, and soil permeating the air told her that it may have been the latter. Knowing she was risking making him upset, she pushed the envelope anyway by inquiring more. Today was your big day, becoming a part of a team. What'd you think about it? It's a start, he said as she sat the plates down on the table. She looked up at him from her lowered head, still splitting the concentration between the conversation and setting the table. Well, don't leave me guessing. Tell me about your team. Sasuke sighed a little as he seemed to be growing tired of the prying. Nonetheless, he obliged. The leader of my team is a man named Kakashi Hadake. Izumi recognized the name. He once worked in the Anbu with Itachi. This she knew because he had been the leader of the team Itachi was on prior to being transferred out, Team Ro. 
she thought of how ironic it was that Sasuke would be on a team led by the same man who led Itachi's team. Sasuke continued, I have two teammates, Sakura Haruno and Naruto Uzumaki. Izumi almost slapped the table. She was right. She had hoped this would happen, and now it was happening. Maybe Hiruzen wanted this as much as she did. She would nod as she listened. That sounds nice. Isn't Naruto that boy you thought was kinda cool? Sasuke looked at her as if she were an idiot. No, he's a loser. I would have rather been teamed up with anyone else in the village. Izumi smiled. You think that now, she thought to herself, but you'll think about it a little differently in about a month or two. She looked to him and spoke. What about Sakura? Didn't you say she has a crush on you? Sasuke sat there, his elbows on the table and his fingers clasped in front of his face, only his eyes peering over the knuckles. Every girl has a crush on me. She's annoying. Right now, Sasuke was acting as if his team left him much to be desired, but Izumi knew different. She had been around Sasuke long enough to understand how he worked, and despite the fact that he wasn't showing it or acknowledging it, he was excited about his new friends and mentor. That part of Sasuke was one she wished he would openly embrace, embracing the love of his friends. But he had already been burned once by someone he adored, and so him acknowledging these feelings may take some time. Then again, they had all the time in the world. The next day, she awoke to find Sasuke getting up as well. Normally, she was always up before him. Today, he was coming out of his room just as soon as she was. She seemed to understand that this might be him being excited. He was going on his first mission today. However, as the day passed, he returned and seemed less than excited. As it turned out, the missions he had undertaken that day were no more than simple chores around the village. She remembered that time in her life, that time when she was a genin and every mission was about as important as walking the dog or getting a cat out of a tree. They were easygoing missions, meant to teach more than anything. A wax on, wax off type of mission. But he wasn't content. He wanted more, even if he wouldn't say it. But she knew if he stuck with it, then he would get what he deserved. And that day eventually came a few mornings later, when he and the rest of Team 7 were assigned by Hiruzen to escort Tazuna to the Land of Waves. It seemed this was given to them due to a request from Naruto, another on the team who had grown tired of the easy pacing. She had to hand it to him. He knew how to get what he wanted, and he wasn't too shy to try. Sasuke would pack some things into a bag quietly. He would have told her what was going on, but he didn't feel obligated to say anything more than, I'm going to be out of the village for a few days on a mission. And honestly, that was a proper response. She let him go, and continued her daily duties. While Sasuke was gone, she would get called upon by Hiruzen to a meeting. She would appear before the Hokage and await instructions. She, along with many other Chunin and Jonin were informed that the Chunin exams were in preparations. Honestly, Izumi had forgotten that the exams were so close. Hiruzen would inform them that soon enough, members from other villages would start filling into their village, as Konoha was hosting the exams this time around. What Izumi and the other Konoha Nin were to do would be to watch as the foreign shinobi came into the village. It was important to watch them in case they were there to spy or plot, but it was equally important that they should have proper protection. Should an incident occur in the village in which a Genin from another village were to be killed outside side of the exams under suspicious circumstances, it was possible that this could be taken as a sign of aggression on Konoha's part and lead to a war. At worst, possibly the fourth Shinobi World War. Izumi shuddered. Having been alive during the time of the third, she knew the pain it could cause firsthand, as both her brother and mother were in that war. Konoha was gracious enough to schedule their deployments opposite each other. While that meant that her father and mother were apart for the duration of the war, it also meant that one of the two parents could be around to take care of Izumi. Eventually, both of her parents were deployed to fight in the war, leaving little Izumi all alone. Thankfully, there were kind souls in the village who looked out for her, and while she was lonely, she knew her parents were going to be needed to protect the village. She was still worried as any child would be. She prayed for their safety every night, and she read the newspaper every day in hopes that there would be good news in regards to the war's end. She recalled when word reached them that the Conaby Bridge had been destroyed. She didn't know what it meant, but she was informed by an adult nearby that it meant the war would end soon. With the bridge gone, the enemy would have a hard time getting food and supplies, meaning that they'd have to go home. It began to be known that Shinobi would be pulled back from the war, and the prospect of that excited Izumi. Every day, she would wait in front of the gates. She she remembered getting a sunburn because she waited so long. Shinobi would come through the gates and pass her by without word of her parents. Her worry began to set in, but three days after the first Shinobi came home, she saw them. A man and woman passing through the crowd with smiles on their faces. Tears of joy coming to her eyes, she ran to them. That night, they told her of how they were outnumbered and surrounded, but how the yellow flash of the leaf appeared and single-handedly killed every Iwan Nin in the area with his flying Raijin technique. That night was a good night, but she knew how easily she could have been left waiting at that gate for eternity, waiting for people who would never return to come home. And that was why she knew how important the mission Hiruzen had given her was. She and her peers were the one thing standing between all the children of the leaf and losing their parents. So she began to go about her work with incredible conviction. Looking up, she did not see 
Wotan everywhere. The crow was still watching over Sasuke, and that was a good thing. She watched the different village's shinobi come in. There were shinobi from Sunagakade, chief of which were Gara, Konkodo, and Tamari, the children of the fourth Kazakage himself. For that reason, a greater than average security detail was granted to them, and the Hokage even offered private residence to them away from the other prospective chunin that were there. Besides Suna, there was also Amegakure, the village hidden in the rain. It was a village where rain was a constant, and their people were led by the legendary shinobi Hanzo of the Salamander. They were a reclusive village, but their shinobi were always top tier, especially in the recent years for reasons that could not be explained. Then there was Otogakure. This village was a relatively new one. It was unknown who their leader was, and most everything about Oto was unknown save for their shinobi were unusually brutal, something that caused Hiruzen to demand extra security on the teams over. Izumi was personally requisitioned to watch over the Kazakage's children. In doing so, she realized that they were brutal. They had no qualms in attacking others or even each other, with Gara keeping his siblings in check under threat of death, something they truly feared, meaning it wasn't just a metaphor. She would watch them for most of the day until the shift change in which she was allowed to go home. It was then that Sasuke stumbled home. He was tired and beat up, his arms covered in cuts and bruises, and even small pin dot marks. She asked him what happened. He mentioned that he had been on a mission to the Land of Waves, and that during this time he had been attacked, along with the rest of his team, by a group of rogue shinobi from Kirigakure. He would say that he had almost died, but managed to survive by the skin of his teeth. She would pull out a first aid kit and administer treatment to him, cleaning each of his wounds and wrapping them in bandages so they could heal. During this time, Sasuke spoke of how Kakashi possessed a Sharingan. Izumi mentioned that she had known of this due to knowing Kakashi and his reputation in the past. She thought Sasuke might be excited to have a teacher who had similar abilities to him, but she was mistaken. Sasuke spoke of it with contempt, believing it to be deplorable that he would bear the eye of his people without having been born of it. Izumi elected to stay out of this. Sasuke, however, would drop the subject, as Kakashi had used it properly to protect his team and defeat the enemy. He further mentioned that he wasn't sure how they survive. He remembered being caught by the demonic mirroring ice crystals technique, and taking a shot meant for Naruto and almost dying. The next thing he remembered, he was awake on the bridge and the battle was over. Izumi would ask Sasuke about taking a shot for Naruto, but Sasuke waved it off. When she pressed him about it, he would tell her that his body just moved, it wasn't a planned action. Izumi would smile. Sasuke refused to admit it and would not say as much out loud, but he was beginning to actually care for his team. He was making friends, and that was something she was pleased with. The next day, as she was watching over the people coming into the village, she was informed that Sasuke would be able to take the exams along with his team, which pleased her immensely. As the tuning exams came around, her role began to change. She was requisitioned to help create the scrolls, with which the Genin would attempt to pilfer to the center structure during the Forest of Death. The scroll was simple, it was merely two jutsu types. One was a sleeping Genjutsu, Jutsu, the other was a summoning jutsu. Both were required to have a location in which they would work. For the sleeping jutsu, the area of effect was anywhere outside of the Colosseum, and as for the summoning jutsu, that was inside the stadium. Two scrolls would be required to move on, and that was the heaven and earth scrolls. Both were a different color, but the contents were the same. As the first exam came to a close, and the second was beginning, she gets called back by one of her senior jonin. Whatever it was, it was an emergency. She rushed to her superior's side, where she was informed along with her peers that one of the shinobi groups from outside of Konoha had been murdered. They examined the bodies. They were Kusanin, the team known as Team Shiore. She thought this was highly suspect, as she had just seen them enter the forest of death, but what was even stranger was that they were all missing faces. Considering the temperature of the bodies, she realized they'd been dead far longer than the forest of death test had been taking place. She would realize that whoever she saw enter the forest of death could not have been the real Team Shiore, and could only be imposters. Because of this, a team was sent into the forest to apprehend Team Shiore. They needed to bring the killer to justice, otherwise it would mean war. As she went in, she was paired with Anko. They would encounter Orochimaru, the one who had killed the Kusanin. Together, Anko and Izumi would fight, with Orochimaru showing great interest in Izumi's eyes. For a time, he considered also placing a curse mark on her, but when it failed due to Anko's interference, Orochimaru decided to cut his losses. After all, he had already marked another shinobi possessing the Sharingan earlier. Why would he need another? With one swift strike, one of Orochimaru's snakes bit Izumi. She landed on the tree branches and held her wound. She tried to help Anko, but instead she passed out and fell from the tree. Izumi was out for a while, but eventually she was awakened in the hospital. She had been treated for poison. Normally, they could not help her with the level of poison that was administered, but with Anko and Hiruzen's help, due to both knowing who Orochimaru was, she was capable of recovering when an anti-venom was created. The Forest of Death exam was over by the time she woke up and was able to leave the hospital, but the preliminary exhibitions were about to begin. She had been informed that Sasuke was also attacked by Orochimaru, and so she went to check up on him and see if he was okay. He mostly was, but his ninjutsu was heavily hampered due to a curse mark placed 
placed on him, a mark Anko also shared, a mark known as the Curse Mark of Heaven. She urged Sasuke to drop out of the exams, but he refused, stating that this was his chance to get stronger faster. He managed to win the first round utilizing nothing but Taijutsu. This astounded her. His opponent was far from unreliable, and Sasuke still managed to beat him without ninjutsu. After this though, Sasuke would allow Kakashi to put an evil sealing jutsu over top of his curse mark to keep it from spreading, though the process was painful and left him unconscious for a while. Sasuke was out for quite some time, and she kept him in her care for the duration of this time. Wasn't like it mattered much, the tuning exams were slated to take a month-long pause after the end of the preliminaries, and Sasuke would have that time to rest and train. His rounds were already over for the month. Eventually, the exam's preliminaries came to a close and Sasuke had fully recovered. Once more, he was packing his bags though. She asked him what he was doing and he responded that he was going off to train with Kakashi for a month. Izumi would wish him luck and tell him to be careful. Sasuke would leave the home without replying to her further. Izumi had things to do this month as well. Orochimaru was confirmed to be in the village and she needed to help the village's forces find him before he could cause any more trouble. She would join the others in search of him. He was an expert in espionage as most shinobi were, but Orochimaru was something truly special, a real snake in the grass. It was suspected that Orochimaru had come for Sasuke, but if that were true, he would have taken him, right? He didn't take him. He branded him and left. So what was the mission besides that? By this time, it had been discovered that Otogakure was siding with Orochimaru, but at this point, there weren't any shinobi from there left in the exams. Zaku had his arms brutally mutilated in the exams in his battle against Shino, something that would likely end his career as a shinobi. And his accomplice, Kintsuchi, had disappeared from public view. Both were taken somewhere else, and Dosu was found murdered after the end of the preliminaries, suggesting that whatever connection they had to Orochimaru was now in jeopardy due to their failure. However, it was obvious that they had other spies in the village. During her investigation, she spots a suspicious shinobi girl that she can't help but get a bad feeling from. Her suspicions are proven correct when she witnesses a black mark on the back of her neck. She follows her, and when she does so, she would discover where she was based, an old abandoned building in the Uchiha compound. She grunted, knowing that Orochimaru was utilizing the site of her clan's downfall as a place to overthrow Konoha from. She would inform the others, and they would go to where they would find markings on the ground, but no sign of Orochimaru nor the girl. They would examine the markings and learn that it was indeed a sealing formula, but for what? They would report back to Hiruzen with their findings, and he'd begin to show fear. These markings were ones he recognized. He hadn't seen these since the first Shinobi World War. He explained to them that these markings were used for a profane ritual that Tobirama Senju had created during the first Shinobi World War. It was called the Impure World Reincarnation Jutsu, a jutsu meant to form Ido Tensei, undead warriors who were both immortal and completely under the control of Orochimaru. Furthermore, he points out that the two separate circles connected by a sealing formula reference that Orochimaru has just resurrected two warriors as Ido Tensei, but who they are remains a mystery. For a time, the shinobi continue to investigate, but they don't turn up any leads. As the tuning exams continue, suddenly a smoke bomb goes off in the Hokage's viewing box. Izumi is the first up there where she finds both the Kazakage and Hokage have disappeared. What's worse, the village is being attacked by snakes and most everyone in the Colosseum have been put to sleep. She would attempt to help out in any way she could. She would try to help Hiruzen, but the barrier that the Sound 4 had erected had left her as nothing but a spectator. She's forced to watch as Orochimaru summons the bodies of the second and third Hokage. He even tries to summon the fourth, but for some reason it fails. Hiruzen would be forced to utilize the Reaper Death Seal to deal with them. He seals away the first and second Hokage, and then attempts to seal away Orochimaru, but when that fails, he resolves to seal away only his arms, which cripples Orochimaru. Orochimaru would then, with the help of the Sound 4, escape the village. Izumi would rush to the Hokage's side, but he was dead his soul consumed by the Shinigami. The feeling was somber, and Izumi was fearful that this would lead to war. With the Hokage dead, Konoha was left without a leader, and with the discovery of the Kazakage's body, it could very well be a sign that war was coming. Then again, as she thought about it, the Kazakage's death may have been a blessing in disguise, as Suna was also without their leader, which meant they couldn't just attack them now. This bought them some time. They needed a new Hokage. This position was offered to Jiraiya, but he refused it. In turn, they sent him and Naruto out after Tsunade in hopes that maybe she could lead them. They needed a strong and competent leader. Someone who could command the world stage. Someone more than just a brilliant mind, but someone with a lot of presence. A legend. Someone who could be verified as strong. 
and there were few more qualified than the legendary Kunoichi, the Sani and Tsunade. While Naruto and Jiraiya left, Izumi remained home with Sasuke. He'd been released from the hospital after his battle against Gara, but he wasn't his usual self. He was mopier. He was bitter because he spent so much time growing stronger, even going so far as to use the second stage Curse Mark of Heaven against Gara, and couldn't keep up with Naruto, someone who had proven time and time again to be worthless as a shinobi. He was being outdone, and he didn't like that. All of his training was proving to be useless. However, he was invited to meet with Kakashi. That night, however, as she was putting up the dishes after supper, she heard the call of a crow. She looked to the open window to see Wotan sitting on the windowsill, looking at her. He wanted her to follow him, and so that's exactly what she did. It led her out of the village and past the gate. She eventually lost sight of the bird. She looked around for it, but couldn't find it. That was until she heard it crow again. Looking up, she noticed the crow perched on the arm of a man in a black coat with red clouds on it. The man gently stroked the crow with his finger as the bird lovingly rubbed its head against him. He looked down at her, his crimson eyes glowing in the darkness. To anyone else, they might believe it to be a monster, but not Izumi. She knew better. Itachi. He looked down to her and smiled. Izumi. She smiled. She almost wanted to cry. He jumped down from the tree, landing in front of her. How is Sasuke? She looked off into the distance as she put her hands in her pockets. He's a little bit bitter right now. One of his friends has proven to be superior than him with less training, and he's angry. Itachi nodded. That's just how rivalries work. You never want to be on the losing end of one, but it doesn't mean it never happens. You've just got to accept that and work even harder. That's what I told him, Izumi said. It just hasn't seemed to take yet. Itachi nodded. He looked down. I came back to tell you to warn the village. A partner and I have been requisitioned to take the Nine Tails. Izumi cocked her head. Why? Itachi shrugged. Not entirely sure. We're currently looking for all tailed beasts. She nodded. Itachi was silent. That's not entirely it. She looked to him inquisitively. Itachi avoided eye contact. I just wanted to see you again. It's been years, and I knew I would be in Konoha. I thought it would be a good time to visit. I can't stay long, though. Kisame will only be preoccupied for a short time longer, and he already doubts my convictions. Izumi nods. I won't lie. I've been thinking about you a lot lately. Sasuke reminds me of you in subtle ways. His mannerisms, his fighting style, his way of carrying himself. It's so similar. I sometimes have to double take thinking he is you, but his personality is just so different. Itachi would look down once more. That's my fault. I put him into this position and manipulated him into accepting the curse of hatred the Uchiha have carried with them for over a thousand years. Izumi walked over to him. Don't blame yourself. There are things we just can't control. Itachi shook his head. There are also things we can control. And I forced Sasuke to hate me. He's miserable because of me. She would lean forward, her face illuminated by the moonlight as her lips touched his. I love you, Itachi Uchiha. Itachi neither fought it nor reciprocated. He just sat there with a straight face, not engaging in anything. He did not feel worthy enough to. She pulled away. I'll continue to watch over him. Itachi would smile and thank her before disappearing into a flock of crows, Wotan remaining with her. The day after, Itachi and Kisame would enter Konoha, where they'd be located by Kakashi and Might Guy. Guy would drive them off, but Kakashi would fall into the genjutsu Itachi had placed upon him. Sasuke would also eventually learn of this and would race off after Naruto and Jiraiya to stop Itachi, only to have his wrist broken and his mind influenced by Tsukiyomi. He'd be returned to the hospital where Izumi would rush in just to be with him. Seeing the condition he was in, as well as the Tsukiyomi genjutsu he was cast under, she knew that Itachi was still attempting to make Sasuke hate him. She loved Itachi, but she disagreed with this. She knew what Itachi was doing. He was trying to make Sasuke hate him so he could become the hero of this story by killing him, but she didn't like that one bit. She was then considering telling Sasuke the truth. She couldn't let this continue. If she told Sasuke what was really happening, maybe she could alter his way of thinking. She never got the chance to, though, because one night, just after being healed by Tsunade, the new fifth Hokage, Sasuke left the village to join Orochimaru. Itachi's plan had backfired. His hatred of Itachi had overpowered the love of his friends, the side of Sasuke that Izumi was trying to foster. For all the love she felt in her heart for Itachi, she knew he was in the wrong for what he had done. A team was sent after Sasuke to bring him back to the village, whether he wanted to or not, but in the end, it wasn't enough, and Sasuke joined Orochimaru. Izumi would lay in bed that night, thinking about how empty her home was now. Sasuke was always silent, yes, but this was different. This was a different silence, and one that filled her full of dread. She needed to stop Sasuke before he did something he'd regret. And that's where I plan to stop things for now. Of course, there is a part 3 coming very soon, so keep your eyes open for that. Be certain to drop a comment down below and let me know what you thought of this what if. Let me know the things you might like to see in part 3. Did you enjoy our video? Well, then be sure to check out these other great videos from the Amagi. And make sure to subscribe and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos.